This Oregon story begins in the 1800s after settlers showed up and started forming towns in this territory. Oregon's lumber, gold, and other products were desired by the rest of America. Communication and commerce depended on ships safely traveling up and down the coast. Navigational aids were needed to guide these ships away from dangers and to a safe entry into ports. The lighthouses of Oregon were created and their history of aiding maritime navigation began. Join me as we visit these lighthouses and learn their stories. Each lighthouse can teach us something different about Oregon's coastal history. Most of these impressive sentinels stood the test of time and nature. In the mid-1800s, the Western Coast Survey was started. The survey would decide which sites on the west coast were good locations to build a lighthouse. One of the first sites was at the busy and dangerous Columbia River entrance. The mouth of the Columbia River is also known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. Thousands of ships have been lost here due to shifting sandbars, storms, and deadly currents. Being the largest coastal river entrance with the most traffic, navigational aids were of high importance. The Oregon lighthouses of this area have been lost for a few different reasons. The first lighthouse planned for the Oregon Territory was Cape Disappointment. A ship called the Bark Oriole was transporting construction materials. Like many ships in this area, the dangerous conditions caused it to wreck and lose all the cargo, setting back the lighthouse completion schedule. When the lens arrived, they realized it didn't fit in the structure. They had to rebuild the lighthouse because of this. Finally, in 1856, Cape Disappointment was the first lighthouse built in the Pacific Northwest. During the original lighthouse survey, this was in the Oregon Territory, but today, this land is in Washington. While it is not an Oregon lighthouse, it is an important part of the Columbia River history and still lights up today to aid traffic. There were also two lighthouses built on the Oregon side of the Columbia River. Point Adams was created at the Fort Stevens area in 1875, but its time was short-lived. The completion of the South Jetty had caused the lighthouse to become too distant from the mouth of the Columbia. The military base at Fort Stevens also thought of the lighthouse as a hazard. They had hidden artillery batteries that would have had attention drawn to them by the lighthouse. Point Adams was eventually taken down, with other navigational aids to replace it. After it was taken down, shipwrecks continued to occur at the mouth of the Columbia River. The Peter Iredale was in a hurry to make it to Portland and ended up wrecking on the sands near Point Adams Lighthouse. The skeleton of the Peter Iredale somehow still sits at the beach today. As shipwrecks continued, so did the need for navigational aids at the south end of the Columbia River Bar. Built right in the water in 1902 was the Desdemona Sands Lighthouse.
The name came from a ship called the Desdemona that had wrecked in the shallow water of this area. Lightkeepers would travel to the lighthouse by boat with their families living on the mainland. Eventually, it was automated so the lightkeeper could live on shore. After being used for 30 years, the lighthouse was dismantled and replaced by a simpler and more advanced light beacon. Another version of a lighthouse was a light ship, which could be placed anywhere in the water. There were multiple Columbia River lightships over the years, each with a whole number designation such as LV-50, 88, and 93. LV meaning light vessel. Ships would anchor next to the lightship and wait for a bar pilot to come and aid them through the dangerous river bar. Lightships were more costly than lighthouses, but cost was not an issue when protecting commerce. Eventually, the Columbia River lightships were replaced with large navigational buoys and other technology advancements. The number 604 lightship is on display at the Columbia River Maritime Museum in Astoria. While there are no Oregon lighthouses left at the Columbia River, it was the start of our lighthouse story. After the Columbia, the Umpqua River was the next busiest sea entrance. The area was difficult to select a lighthouse site as it was mostly made up of flat sand dunes. A spot at the mouth of the Umpqua River was chosen as the best option for the first lighthouse built in Oregon. Umpqua River was showing promising growth, with Hudson's Bay Company operating in the Umpqua Basin. The gold rush caused mining towns to sprout up, with everything shipping down the Umpqua River. With rapid growth in the area, they rushed to complete the Umpqua River Lighthouse by 1857. This would be the first lighthouse built in the state of Oregon. Unfortunately, the lighthouse survey crew did not plan on the river during its flood stage. A few years after completion, record water levels and coastal weather caused the tower to begin to tilt. By 1864, two floods had caused more damage and the lighthouse was abandoned. As workers were removing parts of the tower, it began to shake and sway. The workers quickly fled the tower and watched it come crashing down after. After its destruction, the lighthouse board decided to move on with other lighthouses in their plan. People of the Umpqua area were very unhappy with the lack of lighthouse as it made the river bar more dangerous and reduced their trade. Years later, the government decided that there should be no gaps in lighthouse coverage along the coast. A few decades had passed and lighthouses had advanced quite a bit since the first Umpqua River Lighthouse. A second lighthouse was constructed at Umpqua River, but further inland than before. The lighthouse you see standing today was completed in 1894. With nicer inland weather and no need for a foghorn, the site overlooking the Oregon dunes was preferred by lightkeepers. The spinning light originally would run just like an old grandfather clock. Every hour or two, the lightkeeper would have to pull a large weight up the stairs. The weight attached to a mechanism and would slowly fall to turn the lens. The lens sat on a system of chariot wheels so it could be rotated. As electricity was introduced in the 1900s, systems like this would be replaced with electric motors. The most impressive piece of lighthouse equipment is the huge glass lens. 
Oregon lighthouses were all built with a Fresnel lens. Named after Augustine Fresnel, a physicist who figured out how to extend light with stepped glass. A Fresnel lens works by taking the light on the inside of the lens and then pointing it all in one direction thanks to the ridges on the outside. There are different sizes of Fresnel lenses. The ones in Oregon range from the smaller fifth order lens to the larger first order lens. Umpqua River was one of the lighthouses meant to be seen very far out at sea, so it would use the largest first order Fresnel lens. The colored panels and rotation speed give the lighthouse its light signature. Every lighthouse has a unique light signature that tells mariners which lighthouse they are looking at. Umpqua River produces a signature of two white flashes followed by a red flash. Most of Oregon's lighthouses, if still active, can be seen somewhere around 20 miles away. In 2009, the Coast Guard announced that the lighthouse was no longer a critical component for safe navigation and would be deactivated. Thanks to the community pushing back, the lighthouse stayed on with operations being transferred to Douglas County. While the area didn't experience the growth that was expected, the Umpqua River Lighthouse stands as one of the most well-kept lighthouses in Oregon. The lighthouse is still active today and can be toured through the Umpqua River Lighthouse Museum. When the first Umpqua River Lighthouse was lost, they decided to build the next lighthouse to the south. As the town was growing, a lighthouse was needed to guide ships into Coos Bay. A small island sticking out near the bay was selected to build Cape Arago Lighthouse. Cape Arago is actually a few miles to the south, and this island location is known as Gregory Point. For many thousands of years, this area was a home to Native Americans. The island was originally known as Chief's Island by the Coos tribe. They had a village nearby on the mainland, and the people were known as Baldiaka, which translates to shore people. During a very dark time in American history, islands in this area were used to hide from being captured by the U.S. Army. Unfortunately, this land was taken from the native tribes, and the special place of Chief's Island was selected by the Lighthouse Survey. Cape Arago was the second Oregon lighthouse built in 1866. The place on the northern tip of the island was an octagonal tower supported on stilts. Sticking out into the ocean, Cape Arago Lighthouse was in a constant battle with nature. The lighthouse was only accessible by boat through turbulent water. One keeper named William Walker drowned while attempting to return to the island. A few different bridges were built over the years, but none of them could survive the elements. Many years later, erosion started to threaten the structure, and they built a second lighthouse. In 1934, a third lighthouse was built out of concrete to be more durable against the harsh island nature. Being one of the latest Oregon lighthouses built, it would come with better technology such as electricity. Rather than a rotating lens, a revolving panel made the light pattern a white flash every two minutes. The lighthouse became automated in the 1960s, meaning people were no longer needed on the island. The other lighthouses and dwellings were eventually demolished, and the third lighthouse is the only remaining structure. In early 2000s, Cape Arago was deactivated after 140 years of service from the three lighthouses. 
The fourth order Fresnel lens was removed and placed on display at the Coast Guard Station in North Bend. After the lighthouse was deactivated and abandoned, a proposal was made to return the land back to its rightful owners. Native American people have a special connection to this island, with many of their ancestors having been buried there. The bill was passed and the land was returned to the confederated tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla in 2013. The dark history of our land should not be forgotten, but neither should the fact that the lighthouses of Cape Arago saved lives. The bridge to the island has been removed, so the only way to see the lighthouse today is from nearby beaches and trails. Towards the late 1800s, the goal was to place lighthouses so a ship was never without view of one. Even though it was not near a port, Cape Blanco was determined to be a good site to provide light coverage. The light would provide a position fix for navigators and warn ships away from the many rocks and reefs at Cape Blanco. Spanish explorers named Cape Blanco after the chalky white cliffs on the south side of the Cape. In 1870, the lighthouse was completed and a large first order Fresnel lens was first lit. Cape Blanco holds a few Oregon Lighthouse records. Since the original Umpqua River and Cape Arago Lighthouses were lost, Blanco is the oldest standing Oregon Lighthouse today. Cape Blanco is also the most westerly point in Oregon. Being high up on a cliff, Cape Blanco has the highest focal plane at 256 feet above sea level. While the lighthouse helped to guide ships away from the dangers of this area, some shipwrecks still happen due to the rugged waves and rocks. An oil tanker named the J.A. Chancellor crashed on the rocks north of the lighthouse. Most of the crew died as well as wildlife due to the leaking oil. Another ship, the South Portland, slammed into a nearby reef in thick weather. Only half the crew and passengers survived. There were a few notable lightkeepers and families at Cape Blanco. First was the Langlois family, which many lightkeepers came from. James Langlois served at Cape Blanco for 42 years as an assistant and head keeper. His son, Oscar Langlois, became a lightkeeper at Cape Arago and Coquille River later. Another important family from the Cape Blanco area was the Hughes family. Patrick and Jane Hughes both left Ireland and went west for the gold rush. After little success, Patrick found himself laboring in exchange for a piece of land at Cape Blanco. He ran a dairy farm, which was much more lucrative than his gold mining. After some farming success, the historic Hughes House was built in 1898. The family grew and James Hughes was born, who served at Cape Blanco Lighthouse for 37 years. He started as second assistant, then promoted to first assistant, and when James Langlois retired, he became head keeper. Mebel E. Bretherton was the first woman assigned as a lighthouse keeper in Oregon. Men at this time were uncomfortable with this assignment, as it was unusual during these old days. Bretherton turned out to be a successful lightkeeper and went on to work at other lighthouses after her time at Cape Blanco. As technology advanced, lighthouses like Cape Blanco went through many upgrades. The original lens did not rotate, and as they introduced electricity to the lighthouse, they needed a lens that would fit their mechanical gear. The first order Fresnel lens was replaced by the smaller second order Fresnel that you see today. 
Electricity also brought brighter electric bulbs that replaced the oil lamps that originally lit up the lighthouse. By the 1980s, the station was automated and de-staffed. As people were no longer needed, the surrounding buildings were dismantled. The automated light of Cape Blanco is still active today. It shines a bright white light every 20 seconds that can be seen 20 miles out to sea. The oldest remaining lighthouse in Oregon, Cape Blanco, is an impressive structure. For 150 years, it has aided ships along the coast and away from the many dangerous rocks of the area. Just outside of the lighthouse is Cape Blanco State Park, which has a campground, trails, and beaches. The lighthouse is owned by the U.S. Coast Guard, with support provided by the Cape Blanco Heritage Society. As Oregon settlements were rapidly growing, there was a need for a port near the Willamette Valley. Yaquina Bay was becoming a popular port, and private interests encouraged a lighthouse to be planned there. Right at the mouth of Yaquina Bay was chosen for a lighthouse to guide traffic into the busy bay. Before the lighthouse, products from the Willamette Valley would be moved by train up north to the Columbia and then loaded on a boat from there. A railroad was being built straight to Newport so the valley products could be shipped directly from there instead. The port would not be successful without a lighthouse, so the people in charge of the railroad convinced the government to fund a lighthouse at Yaquina Bay. Completed in 1871, Yaquina Bay was activated with a fifth order Fresnel lens. The smaller lens was used because it was a bay lighthouse rather than one used by ships far out at sea. Coming from Cape Blanco, Charles Pierce was the head lightkeeper. He brought his large family with him, and his tenth child was born at Yoquina Bay. This lighthouse's time was short-lived. After just three years, it was replaced with another lighthouse a few miles to the north. The lighthouse survey had gone through another round of surveying Oregon. They decided that the ships traveling up and down the coast should be in sight of a lighthouse at all times. Yaquina Head was chosen nearby, which would mean that Yaquina Bay was no longer needed. Yaquina Bay Lighthouse sat empty until the U.S. Life Saving Service placed a crew in the house. A few years later, the Life Saving Service merged with the Revenue Cutter Service to form the U.S. Coast Guard. They built an observation tower and would be very busy saving lives in the area. In the 1980s, a cargo carrier, the Blue Magpie, was observed to be traveling unusually close to the shore. The Blue Magpie was headed from California to Vancouver, but sought refuge in Yaquina Bay from the heavy sea. The ship's captain was warned by the Coast Guard to not enter the harbor due to the harsh sea conditions. Either because the captain was not a native English speaker, or he thought it was too dangerous to stay out at sea, he attempted to enter the harbor. After a rough night at sea, the 350-foot freighter crashed into the north jetty of Yaquina Bay. As the ship broke into three sections, out poured thousands of gallons of crude oil. Coast Guard helicopters battled heavy waves and wind to rescue the entire crew. After sitting inactive for many years, there were plans to demolish Yaquina Bay in the mid-1900s. Efforts were made to make Yaquina Bay Light a historic site, and the building was saved. In the 90s, the lighthouse was relit using a 250mm modern optic donated by lighthouse enthusiast James Gibbs. While the lighthouse's time was short-lived, Yaquina Bay proved to be a useful site for saving lives. The lighthouse is now owned by the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. 
The Friends of Yoquina Lighthouses group helps to preserve the lighthouse building and history. Shortly after Yaquina Bay was built, a new lighthouse was already under construction. The Lighthouse Board wanted a large lighthouse in the area to provide full coastal coverage. Yaquina Head was chosen to replace Yaquina Bay with a much more visible vantage point. Captain Cook explored this area and had named the land to the north Foulweather due to his experience with the elements. The early lighthouse surveys thought he had met the Yaquina area was Foulweather. Later surveys corrected this mistake which caused some people to believe that the lighthouse was meant to be built at Cape Foulweather. Building supplies were brought to the beach by boat. The metalwork came from Philadelphia and the bricks from San Francisco. Tidal and wave conditions had to be just right as it was a dangerous process. Once landed, derricks were employed to hoist materials up to the plateau. The first order Fresnel lens was manufactured in Paris, shipped to Panama, then shipped up north to Oregon. Part of this precious lens was damaged when unloading and had to be replaced. Completed in 1873, Yaquina Head is the tallest lighthouse structure in Oregon. John Zenner had the longest Yaquina Head lightkeeping career at 23 years. Transferring from Umpqua River Lighthouse, he worked his way up from second assistant, first assistant, to head keeper. When the light's oil was replaced by electricity, Zenner was pleased that he no longer had to do that part of the job. Shortly after electricity, World War II started and lighthouses would be used strategically. The Coast Guard joined the area to keep a 24-hour lookout and patrol of our coastal border. They were especially interested in looking for submarines. Once used for loading lighthouse equipment, the beach is now part of Yaquina Head Outstanding Natural Area. The area gives a rare look at seabird breeding colonies that are usually inaccessible. The rocks serve as a breeding and nesting ground for a large variety of marine life. The tide pools below the lighthouse are some of the most impressive in Oregon. A thorough restoration was completed in the early 2000s, but more work is needed to open it back up to the public. An assessment found damp bricks, which rusted the iron connected to them. Repairs will be expensive, but hopefully a queen ahead can be opened again one day. The largest lighthouse in the state, Yaquina Head, was an important part of Oregon's navigational aid coverage. The area is ran by the BLM, and friends of Yaquina Lighthouses provide preservation and interpretation to the lighthouse. The light of Yaquina Head is still active today. It has a light pattern of two white blinks every 14 seconds. Another lighthouse was needed between Columbia River and Yaquina Head to provide coastal navigation coverage. At first, the cliffs of Tillamook Head looked like a good location, but due to the high elevation, it would not be effective in the fog. The challenging island location of Tillamook Rock was chosen for a lighthouse to be built. The harsh conditions from previous lighthouses were no match for the light nicknamed Terrible Tilly. The head of construction, John R. Toewaves, died while surveying the rock. Charles Ballantyne continued the work but had trouble recruiting people due to the dangers. Those desperate or ignorant enough to join this project had no shelter on the rock other than a tent. 
The top of the island was leveled out with dynamite and the construction was started. Due to a big storm, the workers were stranded for many days with their shelter and supplies being washed away. After over 500 days of construction, the work had been completed. A first order Fresnel lens was finally activated at Tillamook Rock in 1881. The lighthouse became well known both as an engineering triumph and a challenging assignment for lightkeepers. One lightkeeper that came to Tillamook Rock was James Gibbs who wrote about his experience in one of his many maritime books. Like many, he did not come to Tillamook Rock by choice. He had gotten into a little bit of trouble working at the Coast Guard and was sent there as a sort of punishment. Gibbs learned from the more experienced lightkeepers on the rock, George Wheeler and Oswald Alik. The harsh island conditions made work at the lighthouse extra difficult. Seaweed had to be pulled from the foghorn, damage from flying debris had to be repaired, and everything else a lightkeeper does would be more dangerous on the island. The entire structure was flooded with seawater on many occasions. Different attempts were made to improve the defenses of Tillamook Rock. Parts of the building were replaced with iron and steel to improve stability. Cement was added to parts of the basalt rock so they wouldn't go loose and hit the building. The lightkeepers were very isolated from society their only contact being a ship that would come to deliver goods. Some lightkeepers of Tillamook Rock couldn't handle the isolation. Some got agitated to the point of fighting each other, and at one point two keepers agreed to a gunfight before being transferred away. Eventually Gibbs was given notice that his time at Tillamook Rock was over. At first he despised Tillamook Rock but eventually grew fond of it, and part of him was sad to leave. The difficult and important task of keeping the light burning for struggling seafarers was a needed feeling of responsibility for Gibbs. Tillamook Rock aided ships for about 75 years until it was replaced with an automated buoy. Keeper Oswald Alik deactivated the light after his 20 years of service on Tillamook Rock. He moved on to be a lightkeeper at Hesita Head Lighthouse afterwards. Tillamook Rock today sits abandoned. It is privately owned and used as a columbarium for ashes of the dead. The island and lighthouse building can be seen from Ecola State Park and various places on Highway 101. Another lighthouse was needed to fill in the gap between Yaquina Head and Tillamook Rock. Sticking out into the ocean, Cape Lookout looked to be the obvious selection, but it was too tall just like Tillamook Head. Another vantage point right next to Tillamook Bay was Cape Miras, which would be selected for the next lighthouse. The Cape is named after British Captain John Mears, who was an adventurous explorer as well as a renegade fur trader. He had originally named this area Cape Lookout, but due to a map mix-up, this name was put on another cape 10 miles south. Cape Lookout to the south was well known, and by the time they realized this mistake, it was too late, so they used the name Miris for this area. Lighthouse supplies came from Tillamook Bay, first by boat until a wagon road was made. Ironworks came from Portland. The bricks were kilned on site rather than being imported. Timber was abundant in the area, so it was harvested from nearby forests. Two seven-room dwellings were built to house the keepers and their families. The lighthouse was completed and activated in 1890 with a large first-order Fresnel lens. 
At only 38 feet tall, Cape Miris is the shortest lighthouse in Oregon. Thanks to the high vantage point, it provides the same 20 mile visibility as the tall lighthouses. The octagonal tower shape is the only one of its kind on the Oregon coast. The structure is also unique because the tower is covered in iron plates. Unfortunately, there is a history of vandalism at Cape Miris. The building was broken into and parts of the lens system were stolen. Eventually, those lens parts were recovered. More recently, two men fired guns at the lantern room. The outer glass and lens were damaged, with repairs estimated at half a million dollars. The men were later caught and the glass was repaired. While technology advancements improved lighthouses, they also replaced them. The lighthouse was deactivated in the 1960s and replaced with an automated beacon next to the tower. Cape Miris was made a national wildlife refuge because of the many birds that make their homes on the cliffs. The area has some beautiful viewpoints for watching whales, sea lions, and seabirds. Despite being Oregon's shortest lighthouse, Cape Miris was a powerful navigational aid for over 70 years. Today, Cape Miris is a state scenic viewpoint ran by the Oregon State Parks Department. The Friends of Cape Miris Lighthouse provide historical information as well as events and fundraising for repairs. The lighthouse can be visited from a short trail at the state park. Continuing the goal of having a light visible along the entire coast, the central Oregon coast was lacking coverage. Mariners navigating the dark waters between Coos Bay and Newport needed a lighthouse. The prominent headland of Hasita Head was the perfect vantage point for a lighthouse. In the 1700s, Spanish explorer Don Bruno Hasita set out for Mexico for a mission to reach the Arctic Circle. Hasita made it as far as the Columbia before turning back due to scurvy-stricken sailors. He was the first to chart these waters and this prominent headland would later be named after him. To save money, the same plans were used for both Hasita and the second Umpqua River Lighthouse. The structure was equipped with a first order Fresnel lens, but it was British made instead of the French that usually would make them. Construction of Hasita Head took about one year and completed in 1893. The structures right next to the lighthouse were an oil house and a backup oil house. Because these were such fire hazards, a backup was an important measure to avoid a light outage. A bit further away from the lighthouse, there were two buildings right next to each other to house the keepers and their families. The one remaining keeper duplex has been turned into a bed and breakfast known as the Hasita House. When the lighthouse was electrified in the 1930s, the motor sped up rotation, changing the light's characteristic from a white flash every minute to every 10 seconds. The oil lamp was replaced with an electric globe, allowing the lighthouse to emit over a million candle power and be the most powerful light in Oregon. One of the head keepers was Olaf Hansen, who also served at Cape Disappointment and Tillamook Rock. He started as first assistant keeper, then was transferred to Washington for a year and came back to Hasita as head light keeper. Hansen worked to turn the isolated lighthouse location into a sustainable community with a vegetable garden, a schoolhouse, and a post office. After deactivating Tillamook Rock, Oswald Elite came to Hasita to light keep. One night, Oswald had to deal with a light outage from a landslide that had snapped the electrical wires. 
The experienced lightkeeper would not fail at his job and was very resourceful that night. They employed an old oil lamp and turned the lens manually by repeatedly walking around the interior of the lamp room all night. Just like at Tillamook Rock, Oswald the Leak was the last lightkeeper at Hasita before it was automated. The Hasita house is known by many to be haunted. The main ghost story is about the wife of a lightkeeper. Her daughter had drowned, and afterwards, the mother had left the lighthouse. After she passed away, the mother is believed to have returned to look for her daughter. At one point, when Lane Community College was using the building for classes, students used an Ouija board to find the name of the ghost to be Rue. Rue has been seen by many visitors, from strange reflections to unexplainable sounds and things moving on their own. One house painter fled the attic after coming into contact with Rue. A window was broken and he replaced it, but refused to clean the inside of the attic. That night, the owners heard scraping in the attic, and the next morning, all the glass had been swept into a neat pile. Recently, some restoration work costing over a million dollars has been done. Most parts of the lighthouse needed work, including replacing metalwork, masonry, and interior. Hasita Head has been aiding ships for about 130 years. Today, it is one of the most photographed and most visited lighthouses in America. The light still runs every night and is owned by the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. It can be visited through the state park and bed and breakfast, or viewed from Highway 101. At the end of the 1800s, all but one of Oregon's government-built lighthouses had been completed. Coquille River was becoming a popular place for ships to transport timber, gold, and other products. This location was decided to have a smaller harbor lighthouse built right at the mouth of Coquille River. The industry in Bandon was booming. Settlers came for gold, lumber, farming, and fishing. Due to poor roads and no railway, Bandon was essentially cut off by land. Nearly all traffic was by sea. Lightkeeper James Barker transferred from Hasita Head to activate the fourth order Fresnel lens in 1896. Like many other lighthouses, this one had a foghorn in addition to the light. The first class de bull fog trumpet emitted a five second blast every 30 seconds as needed. Keepers would have to constantly run a fire that produced steam for the horn. In early 1900s, oil engines powering a compressed air plant replaced the steam plant to power the foghorn. Right after the lighthouse was built, government engineers developed a plan to stabilize the river to a much deeper depth. That was accomplished by the creation of the South Jetty and eventually the North Jetty. In addition to the lighthouse, this resulted in a large rise in sea traffic to Coquille River. From the lightkeeping Langlois family, Oscar was born at Cape Blanco and came to work at the Coquille River Lighthouse. He started as an assistant keeper, and ten years later he was promoted to head keeper. During Langlois's service at the lighthouse, a forest fire swept into the town of Bandon in the 1930s. One of the main fuels to this fire was an Irish hedge called Gorse that was brought by the founding colonists. Hundreds of buildings were consumed by the fire until only a few were left. The durable lighthouse separated by the Coquille River was not damaged. Some sick and injured were transported to the lighthouse to take shelter. 
Langlois was commended by the Lighthouse Service for helping refugees during the fire. In 1939, the lighthouse was decommissioned after the Coast Guard decided the facility was no longer needed. An automated light beacon and fog signal on the south jetty were built to replace the lighthouse. Both vandals and nature have done some damage to the lighthouse over the years. Violent winter storms deposit piles of driftwood on the beach of the lighthouse and have eaten away at the foundation. Various vandalism, such as spray paint and throwing rocks, has caused damage to the lighthouse as well. Two major restorations were done in the late 1900s and early 2000s. The first restoration involved repairing the roof, replacing old bricks, and a new coat of paint. The second restoration replaced more damaged exterior parts added a false chimney, and changed the color of the lighthouse. The one part that got complaints was the new paint job, which isn't the classic white lighthouse color. Primarily meant to aid maritime traffic, the Coquille River Lighthouse also helped the surrounding community. Coquille River Lighthouse is now owned by the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. It can be visited from Bullard's Beach State Park with a campground and beach right next to it. By the end of the 1800s, all of Oregon's government-built lighthouses had been completed. It wasn't until the late 1900s that two new private lighthouses would be built. One was created at the north end of Cape Perpetua. Cleft of the Rock Lighthouse was built by James Gibbs, the author that shared his experience at Tillamook Rock earlier. Being a lighthouse expert, Gibbs had all the information available to build the exact lighthouse he wanted. A big benefit to this lighthouse style was being inexpensive and requiring minimal maintenance. The tower is a replica of the Fiddle Reef Lighthouse in Vancouver. Though it is a smaller structure, it was built with modern technology and has a visibility of 16 miles out to sea. The light signature is a white and red flash every 10 seconds. Though it is a private residence, Cleft of the Rock was made an official navigation marker a few years after it was built. Parts from other Oregon lighthouses were put in Cleft of the Rock. Railings on the stairs are from the keeper's dwelling at Yaquina Head. The stopwatch for the revolving mechanism was used at Desdemona Sands. Brass oil cans from Tillamook Rock and Hasita Head are also in the tower. Gibbs spent his life on the coast experiencing and writing about all things maritime. In addition to his career in the Coast Guard and lightkeeping, he founded the Puget Sound Maritime Historical Society and edited Maritime Digest magazine. Gibbs passed away in 2010 after preserving the legacy of our lighthouses through his writing. The last Oregon Lighthouse was built recently in the late 90s. Another privately owned lighthouse was created in the town of Brookings by the mouth of the Chetco River. Pelican Bay Lighthouse was created in 1999 by Bill Cady as an addition to his home. Cady had grown up on the coast with his father being a lightkeeper in a few California lighthouses. The lighthouse sits at 141 feet above sea level. 
It was commissioned by the Coast Guard as a private aid to navigation. If you look far south to California, you can barely get a glimpse of another lighthouse, the St. George Reef Lighthouse. After Charles Ballantyne completed construction on Tillamook Rock, he came to California to build another island lighthouse. Though it is just outside of Oregon, this would be the next lighthouse to provide coverage south of Cape Blanco. This modern lighthouse is much different than our old rotating lights. Inside the lens are four lamps. If one burns out, it is automatically replaced by the remaining three. The light signature is achieved by the light turning on and off three white blinks every 10 seconds. Pelican Bay Light has a range of 12 miles out to sea. Near Pelican Bay, you can see a few beacons and buoys that aided and replaced many lighthouses. The radio beacon was one advancement that allowed ships to take a bearing at a much greater distance from navigational aids. The light is privately owned, but can be seen from a few places at Brookings Harbor. Pelican Bay is the last of our Oregon lighthouses. Lighthouses have proven to be a very important component in the growth of Oregon. These impressive structures were a constant battle against the powerful forces of nature. The lightkeepers were dedicated and devoted to their important work. While driven by trade and commerce, many lives were saved thanks to these sentinels of the sea. The technology advancements to lighthouses made them more efficient and powerful, but eventually it led to many of them being deactivated. Their replacements provide no stories, feelings, or memories, only a machine doing a task. Thanks to enthusiasts, organizations, and communities, lighthouses and their legacy have been preserved. Whether one makes their living from the sea or just visiting, lighthouses are a symbol of hope.